difficult to find a starting point, isn't it? In, in, in our school, starting in 1960, oh God, I finished in 1968, so uh, you can work back to 63, 64, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. 63 and 4, I started, yeah. But I didn't start sculpture until much later. Okay. Yeah, much later. If you... <coughs> well, um, uh, we were encouraged to do quite a lot of things at Leeds, try different... Um, we did a hell of a good art education, actually. They, they gave us lots of uh, courses and workshops in various manners. You know, I learned how to throw pots, for instance, you know, ceramics, very, si very basic. And I learned how to um, weld steel and use metal, and I learned how to paint properly and mix the paints, so because we went, they brought the guy in from the paint <laughs> department, yeah. from the painting school, you know. Um, and it was a time, it was a hell of a lot of money at that time, because the Labour government had just come in. Uh, Harold Wilson, with, and the, it was uh, a slogan, education, 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 you know. And they, um, there was a lot of money flowing around for, uh, <coughs> for part-time teachers as well as materials. I never paid a penny for materials. Because it was all there, yeah. yeah. So do you think that was an important kind of form? Because I'm trying to build up towards where, where the sculpture began. Um, That's what I can remember very clearly it, it began for me because um, they'd bought a whole lot of perspex in various colours okay. and, um, <clears throat> and nobody wanted to use them for some reason. So I, you know, I inquired if I could use them, use, use the material, oh yes, yeah. And, and that, that got me going because basically using colour in, as in, in the sculpture. And of course, that colour was getting fashionable in sculpture yeah. at that time because of the, um, the Whitechapel Gallery exhibitions of, of the uh, new generation people, which was uh, in, I think, 1967 or something like that. Had there not been a lot of colour before? No. No. None at all. Yeah, I mean the generation, the, um, the, the Henry Moore, Frank Dobson generation, um, going back a long way, of course, just after the war, they never used any colour in their work. There might have been one or two oddballs who put some colour into their work sometimes, yeah. But you, you know, when you started, you found that interesting to try and um, see what could be done. Well, it was, it was being talked about, especially by one of the teachers who'd just come from London called Glyn Williams, who was a sculptor who had died recently, actually. And he, he'd come back from looking at this and, and gave us all a talk and said, Scott, you don't have to worry about using all this grey, um, boring material. There's all this colour you can use. You know, there's fibreglass, there's plastics, there's this and that, yeah. So he was full of bounce about it, yeah. But that's got, that got me going. And then I realised that I preferred to make things rather than try to paint them. Mm. Yeah. Because I was always being told off for mixing the paint on the painting. <laughs> mixing the colour on the painting rather than on my palette. <laughs> oh, dear. Is that not a thing? No. <laughs> it might be now. <laughs> but not by... Some of the more staid teachers in the in yeah, these yeah. art school, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> oh, okay, but Harry Thubram was was a one hell of a um, uh, personality, strong personality who put his stamp on that place, mm. and um, they uh, he became pretty famous for his teaching actually, and teaching life drawing where he, where he would not um, insist that the models had to keep moving, or even if they were sitting, or like I am now, they couldn't sit absolutely still, they would just be normal, or smoke a cigarette or something like that, you know, so the students had to just quickly get their hand in. And then, and then sometimes he had classes where the models were just walking around all the time. And um, nobody knew what to do. <laughs> But you just had to draw. So you ended up with a paper full of marks, yeah. which had some figurative value. Yeah. 
and they, um, and after about two, an hour of doing this, everybody was getting tired and rather uh, dirty from the charcoal. And then they would stop and put it on the wall and then try to sort, sort out what was uh, better and what was worse. And they did that very well, actually. They, did that. They, they really went into talking about what was good, what was bad, yeah. and trying to encourage us to look with our eyes. Now, I, th I think that was, a, that was the, the best thing in my Arctic ed education, actually, was um, the combination of, that, of those teachers. Yeah. Sixty-eight, I moved to London, okay. and uh, I'd been given a place on the advanced course at St Martin's Art School, and uh, and that was totally different, of course, yeah, a totally different world, okay. because there there was there was a bunch of students there who were coming from various parts of the world who were very serious about what they wanted to do, and um, committed. And I'd never come across that before mm -hmm. in at Leeds Art School. And they were all local. Like, no. Oh, well, it's pretty, you can't show one. Um, uh huh. I think it's much the same as it is now. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not actually, but uh, um, I was, uh, I'd say at that time, I was making designer sculpture. After St. Martin's, um, uh, my final show at St. Martin's on the advanced course, that was pretty successful because a lot of the uh, sculptors from London came around and I got a lot of uh, good, good, um, crit good critiques from, from people. And, um, you know, the, the famous uh, Anthony Cara turned up at the very end of my time at St. Martin's. He'd been, he breezed in like a... Uh, butterfly, and, and um, did you get on with him? Well, I didn't know him very well. But that, you know, um, <coughs> he talked in a manner which was uh, very, uh, uh, he was very confident in the, in the way he talked. Uh, he'd just come back from America when he'd sold very well there, and he'd had a big show in, in the Whitechapel Gallery before he went to America. And things were on the, the up for him. And um, he, he, so he set a kind of uh, aura of success in that place. Although some of the younger sculptors who he had taught, those, um, Philip King, for instance, had a bigger reputation than he did in England anyway. Yeah. Philip was, very, was much bigger. Yeah, yeah. So it took him a while to establish his, his reputation, I think. Yeah, because they, because that new generation of people they were very fashionable, you know. They 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 made the newspapers and that sort of thing. Um, I think it's quite an interesting thing actually. When you're teaching, are you responding whatever to the student is, or are you applying your own rules and your own ideas and you pushing them onto the student? I think I did that. I think I know what you're talking about. You know, I think I did that when I first started and trying to um, the uh, artist's uh, parlance is actually to clone. Mm. Yeah, and, my, and that's the easiest way to teach anybody is to clone them. Uh, you know, and that's what um, that goes on all the time, and, and I hate it because it actually means that it, with with a twenty year old. 20 to 23 year old who's just starting to make art for the first time. Um, <coughs> they, they get one particular way of doing things and they've learned it from the teachers. And, and, they've had, and if they're a very strong personality, they've picked up a lot. And it's very difficult for them to get away from it. And I've seen quite a lot of young people ruined by that, particularly in the German system. Uh, I was talking about it just the other day. Um, yeah, cloning is not on, and uh, and I've seen the uh, I've seen the negative effects of it. But because um, what I was leading up to with that is, uh, um, in order to do that, you must have some very strong ideas about what sculpture is. 
I've got strong ideas about what it was okay. uh, in the past, and um, I'm always waiting to be surprised by what it might be. Okay, well, but on the whole, I mean, the word, yeah, but quickly just to say at the end of that, we've been, we've been um, sh uh, shown so many, so many things which are supposed to be ba breaking the boundaries or whatever they, what terminology they use. Um, and new work, as it were, new art, and um, you know we've seen that it has. It's not new at all. Most of it, very little of it. It's been um, uh, it's more novel than new. Something which, okay, we haven't seen it quite like that before. We haven't seen a pile of rubble in an art gallery well, back in the nineteen seventies, right? Um, when somebody, I think it was in Germany, um, showed a pile of junk for the first time. And that's been done to death now. Um, when it was first showed, it was uh, quite a shock. It was, it was unusual. You don't normally put a pile of rubble in the gallery, right? Or other things like that. So novelty uh, was, was around. And most uh, sculptors, most artists, painters were rather thrown off course by this. Because, you know, what are we putting paint on canvas for? What are we trying, uh, sticking bits of metal together for? When, um, you know, we should be doing something, uh, something new. So, yeah, you were there when that was happening. Oh, yeah. So what, did you, what was your instant reaction then? Well, I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like it as art. I think I developed an eye good enough to see that it wasn't very interesting as art. You know, um, I didn't like, uh, well, a fellow student of mine, he was a friend of mine too, um, uh, Richard Long, heard of him? Yeah. yeah, you know, always getting bits of making stone circles and things and going for walks. Uh, <laughs> it was amusing, but uh, I never expected to make such a splash. You know. So have, you, have your ideas on, you used the word art, um, have your ideas on what that is changed dramatically over the years? No, it hasn't changed dramatically. No. If you were to no. try and summarise your ethos, yeah. how do you attempt to do that? I'm making sculpture because I like sculpture so much. I love, it, I love sculpture and I've seen a lot. And um, when I was young I hadn't seen so much and I was prepared to follow on from the latest kind of thing, which I really liked, right? Which would have been, say, Philip King, mm. just from what one person who wasn't so influential. But um, who was influential on me? Um, Naum Garbo was very influential on me. And, and you know, I like those things. Um, but then later on, I started to look much more at the old masters. And... Um, started to see what the, the, the quality of what some of them were about, was about. Um, you know, obviously the, the big names like Michelangelo. Uh, well, I didn't go to Italy for a long time. I couldn't afford to go to Italy. But, um, <laughs> and I think actually as the, in the 70s, the late 70s, as the, um, the emphasis on newness came around, the, uh, I don't like to use this word serious artist, but more committed to the, to the craft of sculpture and painting, they started to take much more um, interest in the old masters than ever, ever, ever they used to, I think. Yeah. Because in the end, they turned out to be the best stuff to look at in London. <laughs> it was a better thing to see in the National Gallery than there were in... Um, the Institute of Contemporary Art around the corner. You know. so, I mean, are you, you see a lot of sculpture. Do you, as, as, a, as an artist, who, you know, lots, do you worry about the future of... Um, the future of sculpture, yes. Yeah, I think it's in the dire straits. Really? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, okay, I was thinking about this on the train, just coming in now. <coughs> I've just come from Berlin this morning, and, and um, uh, there's a healthy sculpture scene going on there now, which has grown up quite a lot in the last few years. And 
this is from sculptors who are in their in their forties, and quite a lot of them have been um, come out of the academy, the the art academy in Berlin. But some others, other artists, are moving into Berlin now. It's um it's it's, it's popular in Germany from German artists to go to, to go to Berlin, and um. And the scene there is, is, is getting very interesting because, because the young, these guys, the younger artists I call them, um, they are literally trying to grapple with the business of making something which stands on its own legs and, and has its own presence. And it's not uh, just uh, ephemeral. Um, and London, which used to be so vibrant with um, sculpture, seems to have gone, well, it's gone very quiet. First of all, artists can't afford to make sculpture in, in London, very few. Maybe it's going on better in other cities, I don't know. Why but, do you think it's a lot to do with people can't afford to Yeah, do it? it's got a lot to do with economics, yeah, a lot. See, when I st first started in London after art school, um, we could find studios. <coughs> When I find this place with a group of excellent Martin students in South London, which nobody wanted to go to, that was in the pit. That was the pits, but it was cheap. And and then other places came up on the docks. And the developers were putting artists into these buildings on the docks in order to create some interest. And now a place like St Catherine's Dock is <laughs> very interesting. Can man, can man say? You can say, but that was, uh, you know, it was a totally different scene in London then. Those docks were just uh, you know, havens for drug addicts and boozers and, and quite dangerous. Mm. Yeah. So we had this dirty old factory down in, it was, it was an old brewery down in, um, in South London between Stockwell and Brixton. Yeah which was also a pretty tough area as well. I found a lot of the art made, abstract art made in the last um, 20 years to be too um, involved in a, uh, too uh, one-sided one or two-sided, three-sided, but not so much three-dimensional. And um, yeah, I think I started that quite early. This thing has got to look good from all sides. Never does, of course. You know, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to make a sculpture which looks great from every side. Yeah. Well, you can look at some of the great masterpieces of the past, you can, uh, and, and you can see that there's always one or two sides they miss. They weren't sure about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are some masterpieces from the, from, the, from the past where they've managed to, where the artists have managed to achieve that. Yeah. But it's very rare. The question I always, um, people always ask, and when they come, especially with sculpture, uh, and I say, well, I wouldn't know, but and I will ask you, um, with work like this, how do you know when you're finished? Well, I did say that um, earlier that uh, when you come down in the morning and take a first look at fresh eyes, as it were, <coughs> um, it tells you a bit more than it does when you've been in, when you've been in, say, in the late afternoon when you're feeling tired, and um, that gives me a. But normally, it's a rush of of, of of excitement. Oh yeah, I'm there. I've got there. Um, I've, I've yeah, I've got it. Yeah, it's there. It, it's, uh, what else can I say, resolution, yeah. Or, yeah. Resolve, that's right, that's what the... But it's not a specific thing, it's, it's a kind of feeling. It's a feeling, yeah. It's a feeling that it's coming together. It's come together. And then often you'll come back in the studio the next day and you'll find that we're not really there, are we? <laughs> Needs to fit a bit of adjustment. But the adjustment business is quite... is... is um, that's exciting. That's probably the most exciting thing about making sculpture for me is 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 the finessing of of, of um, making sure you know that 
this path is uh, has this this thing is not sticking out too far. And, um, yeah, I know with abstract sculpture you can't really say that because but that. Michelangelo used to reckon that a sculpture should be should be possible to roll a sculpture down a hill and nothing breaks off, yeah. And and I think he, he certainly had something there. In other words, in other words, it's it, it closes in on itself. Um, it's not all like this, yeah. And um, <coughs> he was uh, yeah that stood him in good stead. But, um, but then you think an artist like uh, Bernini, who's one of my favorites, he didn't stick to this canon, if you like. He had a different way of, of handling things. And, but, he, but even so, you couldn't possibly roll uh, most Berninis down the hill because the arms and legs would fall off. <laughs> but he, um, he managed to make his mark by, uh, well, the Baroque manner, you know, movement and uh, fluidity. Mm. Um, oh, God, I got into trouble at St. Martin's when I said I preferred the Nini to Michelangelo. I got shouted down. Who <laughs> 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 uh, uh, The teachers. The bullies. Yeah. The teaching bullies, there were a lot of those. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a very bullying atmosphere there. You might have heard that they instituted these things called forum. Yeah, mm. you heard of those? And um, that was like um, an artist would put his work into, his, into the hall and into a space and then invite. Um, Oh, perhaps about five teachers would be there, plus the other students and one or two invited guests, and everybody would have a go, you know. And it ended up by, uh, well, having a go. It seemed to be everybody was had to say something. But normally it was critical. Normally it was negative. You know? I never ever heard anybody really say anything positive actually. And it, this was, I think, this was actually something which ended the St. Martin's thing. Really? It was, yeah, yeah. I thought it was like the Red Guards in China, uh, Ma Zedong allowing the Red Guards to take over and smash everything up. Mm, that's quite a hard thing to say, but I think it did. I think it, um, that, as that aspect of um, <coughs> bullying and um, uh, bullying people to accept their or your opinion, yeah. and um, shouting down folks who had different opinion, opinions. That was, uh, well, you have to respect other people's opinion, whether you um, like it or not. You know, but you don't rubbish them. No. Yeah, and that was going on too much. Anyway, let's move on from that. When you, um, it this is a thing I, I always wonder about um, sculptors and, and, and artists in general, I think. I'll ask it vaguely and mm -hmm. take, take it where you want. Who are you making them for? Well, that's a good question. Um, I hope I'm making them for eyes who will be able to look or might be able to see what I'm getting at. Mm. Because somebody, somebody has to. Um, I'm not... I'm not making them for myself. I don't think most people understand what I'm doing at all, on the whole, um, because I, I get a lot of comments saying, oh, you've moved on to something else now, haven't you? They seem to think that I jump around from one thing to the other too, too much. But, uh, Do you think that? No. I think it's quite consistent. And <laughs> I suppose I would, yeah. But um, do they... Have they got a point? Maybe, yeah, maybe. I've, um, I've, I've made some good works for my first exhibition in, in the West End, for instance. Um, I made, made three very exciting sculptures and never really um, went beyond that, never took it further. Why? Yes. 
Uh, oh, it was a hard time for me then. I made this exhibition in the West End at Casmin Gallery, and it was successful. We sold all three big sculptures as well. But for my own generation of sculptors, they gave me hell. And they were gen jealous. But they gave me hell. Yeah. And it really upset me, actually. Yeah. Because, right. yeah. No, they really, yeah. And um, the, the Stockwell mob, <laughs> you know. Yeah. They were, uh, I, you can laugh about it now, but I bet you didn't laugh then. I didn't laugh then, no. I was bloody pissed off. I felt like getting out. Yeah. yeah. Until uh, Casimir said to me, but where would you go? You know, you can't afford another. another. This is a cheap studio. What would you do? And he was right. But, um, and did you say? They, yeah, sure. Sure. But it was a terrible atmosphere. They, first of all, they were, um, these guys seem to be into uh, more in, installation works. Mm. Uh, you might have seen the photographs in, the, in that catalogue from Stockwell Depot. Um, there were huge spaces there, and some guys uh, filled up the spaces with, you know, uh, like insulation sculptures. And, um, yeah, they considered me to be um, old-fashioned and um, in it for the market or something. <laughs> but I think there was a lot of jealousy involved, you actually. Were surprised yeah. so well, it was, it was a big break for me. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Was that one of the biggest breaks at the start? That I've ever had. Well, like, was that a big moment? And you, you well, that got me, that, that opened up my career, and that was all the result of, of Clement Greenberg's um, chatting, of, you know, because he visited the, stu the studios back you know, in about 1960, well, or 1970. And um, he, he, he was very critical of what he saw, but he liked what I was doing. And um, as a result of him gossiping or, or, you know, or saying things in London, I got uh, a lot of interest. And Kasmin was one of those people. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a big break for me. Because yeah. I don't think I would have ever got a gallery um, interested in me on my own my own efforts, you know, got to go around photographs and saying, would you give me a show, please? Yeah. Or anything like that. Yeah. No. But it was a different, yeah, but there was a, a, a the scene in those days was very sculpture friendly. Uh, much more, more so than it is, no. than it is now. Yeah. 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 What else would I do? That's a stock answer. What else, oh, yeah. what else would I do? I don't know, what, sit, go to the suburbs and, and, and sit in front of the TV. <laughs> uh, what else would I do? No, I don't know. Um, you know, sometimes it's hell, but basically I enjoy it. Do you still enjoy it? Yeah, yeah. But it can be hell as well. Frustration. The um, physical business of making it, and also um, the uh, yeah, we sculptors have a problem with storage. Um, where do you put it? Are you happy <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm there? Oh, generally. Well, that's uh, hmm. Uh, sometimes, yeah. The sculptor's life is tough, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is actually. I think it always has been. Um, well, you know, poor old Michelangelo had to give it up, didn't he? When he couldn't hold the chisel anymore. And um, quite a lot of stone carvers have had got terrible problems with their hands. I know that. And he had that problem, didn't he? Yeah. He was always going on about storage and spending most of his time in, in, in stone quarries trying to find the right material. He was always complaining. <laughs> um, it's a, I think it is. It's a stupid profession. <laughs> but yeah, but it's enjoyable. I mean, there's a. I think 
so there's a sculpture fraternity, there's a sort of, um, well, you saw it just now, we're not necessarily bosom friends, but we respect each other because we know it's uh, a tough business and it's also a lot of um, uh, competition as well. Yeah, but uh, does it make me happy? Yes, I think it does, yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Nice of you to say that. Yeah. I had a lot of fun looking at them. Good. good. That's what I like to hear. Our because, hmm? Yeah? What yeah. would be the perfect reaction? I'll, I'll have it. <laughs> 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 That'll go very well in my living room. <laughs> what's, the, what's the perfect reaction? Um, uh, when somebody has got it. Uh, aesthetically, they've they they see what I'm on about. They've they've I'm I'm speaking to them, as it were. That's what, that that would make me happy. When I, you, you can pick that up without them even saying very much. And can you tell? Yeah, you can just pick it up. Yeah. Um, sometimes, by the way, they move and uh, uh, move their position. Yeah, you pick it up, yeah. I don't know how. But, uh, and that's what it's all about? That's the, that's the, uh, that is an achievement for me. Yeah, when somebody is on my wavelength, wavelength and has seen what I'm about, because, you know, that comes from me. It's from my feelings, from me. Yeah. And, that, and I'm expressing that in, in an object. And when somebody's on that, has seen that, then I'm very pleased, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just like I'm very pleased when I see um, uh, an example, for instance, the, have you ever been to Olympia? In, in, you've seen the sculptures there? When I, met, when I went there, I've been three times, seen the sculptures in the museum <coughs> from, the, from the gable, from the pediment and some of the others from that great sculptor who we don't know his name, um, you feel that he's right there in the room, that, you know, you can feel that he's speaking to you. And uh, that's what I'd like to do. Yeah. 